Thank you, Daniel Moses, for a job well done. I don't think you need a microphone. Excellent reader. Well, it's a great joy for me to be with you in this uh, series of meetings. Look forward to getting better acquainted with uh, each of you and uh, those of you who haven't met yet. I look forward to that meeting. Uh, Danny spent a lot of time unnecessarily in all of that fault were all about me. <laughs> if he had just introduced me as a gospel preacher, that would be fine. But I do appreciate the kind sentiments that he has expressed. A few subjects in religion that have been more controversial over the centuries than the subject of baptism. And it need not be so if people will just be willing to open their hearts as they open their Bible to study the subject because it's plainly enough set forth. Two major areas of baptism that are controversial, I suppose we would use that term correctly, are the purpose of baptism and the action of baptism. I plan to study with you this morning uh, just what the Bible says about it. Uh, we could spend time profitably and quoting from commentaries and Bible dictionaries and uh, things of that kind. but And there's profit in doing that, but um, it's simple enough to understand what the Bible says about the subject. Now we have to narrow the field of study before we can study the subject of baptism because there are several baptisms mentioned in the New Testament. For example, there's baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's baptism in fire. There's the baptism in water that John preached and practiced, and then that Jesus and the apostles preached and practiced before Pentecost. Jesus referred to his suffering on the cross on one occasion as a baptism in suffering. And then there's Great Commission baptism. Of all of these baptisms, which is the one that is still in force? that is applicable to us today. Are any of them still in force? To hear some tell it, we suppose they would say none is still in force. In Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 5, in about the year A.D. 62, Paul wrote, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now at the time he wrote that statement, all other baptisms had ceased in their application and efficacy. There was yet one remaining, or he would not have made such a statement. That means that Holy Spirit baptism was no longer being practiced. It meant the baptism of John was no longer efficacious, and so forth. But which baptism did John, or did uh, Paul have in mind? 
It was the baptism of which we read in Acts 2 and verse 38. When Peter told believers on that occasion, Pentecost, to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And then he proceeded to say, the promises unto you and to your children, to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. So it obviously was not only for those people of the great assemblage there in Jerusalem on Pentecost, but for many, many others. It's the same baptism of which we read in Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Philip had been preaching Jesus to a man from Ethiopia. And the man saw a body of water and said, Here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And as you read the rest of the account, you see that Philip baptized him upon the confession of his faith. It was the same baptism of which we read in Acts chapter 10. Peter, in this chapter, is in the household of Cornelius, the Gentile centurion. And he says in these verses, Can any man forbid the water that they should not be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It is the same baptism, in fact, of which Peter later would write in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Baptism doth also now save us. Now, how are we to understand or to know that this is the one baptism? That takes us back to the Great Commission, to which we referred earlier. In Matthew's account of it, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, the Lord says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, special attention to this statement. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. As long as this world stands, the work that the Lord was giving to the apostles at that time was to be continued. And that work involved making disciples of the Lord, which involved baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Not baptizing them as disciples, but baptizing them in order for them to become disciples in the <clears throat> New Testament definition of the word from the book of Acts on them. So we're talking about Great Commission baptism. That is the baptism that is applicable to us today. And if our Lord delays his return another 2,000 years, it will be just as applicable then as it was the day he spoke those words and as those words are today. The Lord, not men, is the author of baptism. Men have no right to claim it as their own and do with it as they will. He alone has the right to determine every facet of it, the element of it, the action of it, the purpose of it, the duration of it, and everything else pertaining to it. And so it is to his word that we must turn to find out what baptism is according to the Bible. We'll pursue our subject by means of questions this morning. We'll raise a question and then seek its answer in the New Testament. First question I want to raise is, should everyone be baptized or is baptism for everyone? By this, we refer to everyone who is of age and mental capacity to be accountable for God. We're not talking about infants. We're not talking about those who may be 40 years old but have an undeveloped brain. We're talking about those who are capable of comprehending the word of God and responding to it. The answer to this question is twofold. The first answer is yes, God would have all Baptized. Otherwise, he would not have given the Great Commission as he did. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Or in Mark's account, go into all the world, preach the gospel of the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. 
So yes, all should be baptized in the ideal will of the Lord. But in the real will of the Lord, or in reality, the answer to this question is no. Not everyone should be baptized. The Lord places restrictions upon the candidates of baptism himself, does he not? John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. It would do no good whatsoever for one who denies Christ to be baptized, except to wash the bodies. The unbeliever should not be baptized. But even if one believed in Christ, if he refused for whatever reason to confess with his mouth that Christ is the Son of God, baptism would not avail anything for him. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Those are two separate things. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. One could even confess his faith in Christ, but if he refused to turn away from his sins, and we have met those who have gone that far, but who have pulled back at repentance, that person should not be baptized. They need further teaching, and they need further conviction. On Pentecost, remember, Peter said to believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repentance is to precede baptism. The impenitent believer should not be baptized. A person who is not responding to the gospel of Christ because his heart is in it, because he has of his own will decided to be baptized into Christ, should not be baptized. A person is not properly motivated. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter told the people to repent and be baptized for forgiveness of their sins, verse 41 registers the immediate reaction of many of them. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and they were added unto them in that day, about 3,000 souls. There was the glad reception in their hearts because their question, men and brethren, what shall we do, in verse 37, had been answered. And they felt the great relief that they knew was theirs upon obedience to what Peter had said. It was their decision, their will. They were properly motivated. When Paul wrote to the Romans, reminding them of the time that they were converted to Christ, Romans chapter 6, <clears throat> read a portion of that early part of the chapter earlier, Daniel Moses did. But if you move deeper into the chapter in verses 16 and 17, you'll find Paul saying that those brethren had obeyed from the heart the form of teaching that was delivered unto them. It was not because someone else wanted them to and their hearts were not ready. Maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend or maybe a husband or wife or maybe one's parents had put undue pressure on someone to be baptized. Now, it's good for anyone to want someone else to be baptized, scriptural. Imagine. Parents should earnestly desire this to be the result of their teaching of their children. But if that is the motivation that one has for being baptized, that person needs further teaching. It is not from the heart. It is not their will responsive to the Lord's will. It's their will responsive to someone else's will. If a person does not understand the scriptural purpose of baptism, or understanding it does not agree with the scriptural purpose of baptism, that person should not be baptized. He or she is not ready to be baptized. He or she needs further teaching. There are some who are saying, and have for a few years now among us, that as long as one is doing it to obey God. That's all that matters. He doesn't have to understand the why of it. Well, that's actually not talking about purpose. It's talking about motivation. And that is the right motivation to obey God. But that doesn't say anything about the purpose that the Lord designed for baptism. The purpose of baptism has to do with the fact that the Lord put it at a certain place in the conversion process 
in one's coming to Christ, in one's becoming a Christian, in one's having his sins forgiven, and that that must be understood. There are certain acts that the purpose of the act is so intimately entwined with the act itself that to take away the purpose destroys the act itself or the power of it. Consider the Lord's Supper for a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul discusses the last half of that chapter some aberrations of the Lord's Supper taking place in Corinth. But as he uh, makes those corrections and gives us uh, wonderful instruction about uh, properly partaking of the Lord's Supper. In verse 29, he says, if we eat and drink in an unworthy manner, we eat and drink condemnation to ourselves. We are to examine ourselves and so partake. If we eat and drink not discerning the body, not comprehending the purpose for which we are eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine. You see, it's meaningless. Not only that, but it uh, is simple. The purpose is entwined with the act itself. And you take away the purpose, and it's a meaningless act. And so it is with baptism. You take away the purpose and the uh, uh, understanding or comprehension of it from the one being baptized, and it becomes a ritualistic act. The purpose of baptism is to be the line between the world and the church as far as uh, relationship is concerned. It is the distinction between those who have had their sins forgiven and those who are still in their sins. It is the distinguishing act that brings one from the power of darkness and translates him into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. One needs to understand that or he is not ready to be baptized. Otherwise, every time one goes through a religious act of baptism, matters not what he has been taught about its purpose, even in a denominational setting. One would have to say, well, that's a scriptural baptism. No, one must understand its purpose and design. Well, let's ask another question. Then. Will there be any in heaven who will not baptize? Or to put it another way, can anyone be saved without being baptized? Now, this is a touchy question out there in the world, isn't it? And as we study with our friends and neighbors, uh, We'll be asked this question if we get to the subject of baptism. It's an emotive type of question. And it is often asked for the purpose of uh, raising emotions and letting emotions take over what the scriptures actually teach. Well, there are actually two correct answers to this question as there were to the first question. Yes, there will be many people in heaven who are not baptized. And I do not mean just infants who die in infancy are those who are incapable of responding to the gospel of Christ. There will be many in heaven who are not baptized. The New Testament names many of these. The Lord named some of them. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11, he said, Many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never heard of baptism. But the Lord said they're going to be in the heavenly kingdom. We're familiar with the 11th chapter of Hebrews that has a long list of uh, so many names of heroes and heroines of the faith. It's always been my understanding that the implication of the naming of those names is that those people will be in heaven. They will be saved. And yet not a one of them were baptized or even heard of baptism. Now we could go on with other names that are mentioned in the New Testament and uh, the implication that they are in a saved state and will be in heaven. But those are sufficient to illustrate the point. Yes, there will be many in heaven who are not baptized. 
But now it's very important to understand the next statement. Every one of those of whom it can be said, they will be in heaven without being baptized, lived before Christ died on the cross. Lived before the Great Commission went into effect. Live before the day of Pentecost when the gospel in its finalized state began to be preached and the church was established. If we're talking about those and asking this question who lived since our Lord's death and since the church was established and the Great Commission went into force, then the answer to this question is a resounding no. In statement after statement of the New Testament, this is the answer. There will be none in heaven who were not baptized. And this takes us back to the purpose of baptism. The purpose of it is to change this relationship because sins are forgiven in the act of baptism between the sinner and his Savior. He is lost before he is baptized scripturally with the proper precedence and now he is saved because his sins are forgiven and he has the hope of heaven. There are several statements in the New Testament where baptism and salvation are its equivalent are found in the same statement or passage. In every one of these, without exception, baptism precedes salvation or the equivalent. And is related to it as cause is to effect. Let's just look at a few of them. The order that they appear in the New Testament. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's an unmistakable order of events, is it not? Belief, baptism, and then salvation. John chapter 3 and verse 5, the Lord said to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God represents salvation. There's nothing in the New Testament that answers to the phrase, born of water, except being baptized in water. Thus Jesus says, unless you're baptized, you'll not be in the kingdom of God. We've already noted Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Repentance and baptism before leading to remission of sins. Acts 22, verse 16, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Apparently the sins are still there until the act of baptism. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, a passage that's already been read for us this morning so well. Or are you ignorant that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Baptized into Christ. Is that not where salvation is? Baptism is the doorway to fellowship with Christ where salvation is. The next verse is also helpful. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When does the newness of life begin? When one is raised from baptism. Now, the newness of life should begin in one's mind because of repentance before he is baptized. He should have made that decision that he's going to live a new life, but the newness of life of Romans 6 verse 4 very likely refers to the newness of relationship with Christ, where you have spiritual life now, and you did not have it before. That comes after baptism, not before. Paul makes a striking brief statement about baptism in Galatians 3 verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. Now, if uh, I had a marker board up here behind me, I would label two columns. I would put over one of them in Christ and on the other one baptized. 
I could not put a single name over here of those who are in Christ before I put his name under baptized first, <laughs> according to what Paul says here. Notice, as many of you as, the very same number <laughs> of you who are baptized into Christ did put on Christ, and that's the equivalent of salvation coming into Christ and all of his spiritual blessings. And then just the other statement we referred to in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism doth also now save us. So just on and on and on like hammer blows. The Holy Spirit is telling us in the New Testament, baptism is necessary for salvation. There is no salvation outside of Christ. There's no getting into Christ apart from baptism. From every angle that you want to look at it. The Lord has taught us the answer to this question. Will there be any saved who are not baptized after the Lord's death on the cross? Now another question. Does the New Testament tell us what the action of baptism is? Well, yes it does. In Acts chapter 8, referred to before, Philip preaching Jesus to and then baptizing the man from Ethiopia. The latter part of the chapter says that they both got down out of the chariot and went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, Philip, baptized him, and they both came up out of the water. Now what did he do, what did Philip do to the eunuch while they were both in that water? Did he, as some uh, pictures we've seen hanging on walls, uh, dip some water in his hand and pour it over the eunuch's head or sprinkle it upon him? Uh, we think not. We've already noted where Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism. And he made a similar statement in Colossians 2 and verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, wherein also we were raised with him. So what did uh, Philip do to the Ethiopian in that body of water when they went down into it? He buried him when he baptized him. There's only one meaning to the word that comes over into our New Testament. It's not really a translation. It's simply a, an English word built upon the Greek word, baptizo. And that definition is immerse, plunge, dip, submerge, overwhelm. Just as in our English language, there are distinct words for dipping or for pouring and for sprinkling in the Greek language. The Holy Spirit chose the one that means to immerse. And so the action of baptism can have no mistake about it if we're content with the New Testament. Does the New Testament tell us <clears throat> what baptism is for? Well, we've talked about its purpose some already, but let's explore the passage upon which uh, some raise a controversy concerning this question. In our King James Version Bible, Acts 2.38, has Peter saying, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And when we emphasize that Peter has to be meaning for, in order to receive remission of sins, the quibble is returned to us, no, for is capable of, of meaning because of. And of course that is true. Now it doesn't mean that that's what Peter meant, but it's true that the preposition for in our English language can mean because of or in order to the action that follows. We use it uh, in both senses every day in our common speech and context uh, tells us to automatically uh, translate as to which one of those it is. And so we don't even think about it. We just automatically know the meaning of it by context. If I go to Kroger for a loaf of bread, I go there in order to get a loaf of bread, not because I already have one. 
But if uh, old Uncle Willie is uh, in the state pen for stealing, he's not in there in order to steal. Well, he might steal while he's in there, but he's in <laughs> He's not in there for that purpose. He's in there because he stole something and was convicted of it. So there are your two usages. Which one did Peter have in mind when he said for remission of sins? Well, what difference does it make, someone may be thinking? And some of our supposed very scholarly brethren are asking the same question. Now, what difference does it make? It makes the difference in eternal life and eternal damnation is all. It's a pivotal passage. And the meaning of this preposition is pivotal. For remission of sins is baptism because we have already received remission of sins. Is that what Peter is saying? Repent and be baptized because you already received remission of sins. Or was he saying, repent and be baptized in order that you may receive remission of sins? The Bible is its own best commentary in many cases, and this is one of those cases. We have this identical phrase in another context by which we may test its meaning in this context. For what it means in one, it means in both. When the Lord instituted his supper, first account of it in the New Testament is in Matthew 26. As he took the cup and gave thanks for it, gave it to the apostles, said, drink ye all of it. We're in verse 28 now. He then said, this is my blood of the new covenant or the new testament which is shed or poured out for many for remission of sins very same phrase isn't it now let's uh, test what the lord might have meant by the phrase in this context could he possibly have been saying this is my blood of the new testament or the new covenant which is poured out because you already have remission of sins? If so, then why did he have to die? He had to mean, of course, in order that you might receive remission of sins. It means exactly the same thing in Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized in order that you might receive remission of sins. The American Standard Version is helpful here because it uses a preposition that gives the force of the direction of the action. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. There cannot be an equivalent about the direction there in that uh, preposition. But you don't even need to go to Matthew 26, 28, you can just stay right there in Acts 2.38 and see the fallacy of saying that the Lord or Peter is saying, repent and be baptized because your sins have been forgiven. Repentance and baptism are tied together as coordinates with the conjunction and. And however one of them is related to the object, both of them are equally related to it. If baptism is because sins have been remitted, then repentance is after remission of sins as well. But if repentance is necessary before sins can be remitted or forgiven, then where does that take us with baptism? Baptism must come before sins are remitted. Yes, the New Testament tells us what baptism is for. It is for, unto, in order to receive remission of sins. This takes us back to the answer to the question earlier, will there be any saved who are not baptized? Not after Pentecost, because baptism is necessary for salvation or remission of sins. Is baptism a meritorious work of men? This is what some say it is. 
In fact, when uh, we insist as uh, faithful students of God's word that baptism is necessary for salvation, often this is the accusation that is thrown our way. You then believe you can work your way to heaven. Baptism is a work of man. You have to do something yourself to earn your salvation. It's a work of merit. Well, strange that the New Testament never depicts it as such. We agree, of course, that there's no way that any human being can merit his or her salvation. We cannot be good enough. We cannot do enough good works. Uh, we just cannot do it. That's why Christ had to die on the cross. We couldn't save ourselves. We had to have a Savior. But is baptism a work of our merit? Does it somehow serve as a meritorious work? You know, it's a, um, an amazing thing about the New Testament that there never has been, and I'm confident there never will be, a religious error that has not already been answered in the New Testament. Here we are 2,000 years past the time uh, that the New Testament was completed, well, about 1,900 years. And it doesn't matter what the devil comes up with, the answer to it, is already here. But wouldn't it have to be that way for the Lord's promise to the apostles to bring true? John 16, 13, he said he would send the Holy Spirit upon the apostles who would guide them into all the truth. Well, if they were guided into all the truth by the time the New Testament was completed, which the New Testament itself teaches is the case, then all the truth is here and every error has thereby been answered. Now, we may not have found the answer to every one of them yet, but the answer is there. That's why we need to keep on digging and studying, reading, applying. But this error we're talking about right now, accusing baptism of being a meritorious work, was answered in the New Testament. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 Paul said, not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves. There's your meritorious works, you see. Works of our own righteousness. It's not by those. Not by works done in righteousness. Were we saved? Could we be saved? But by his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, just as John 3, 5 speaks of being born of water and nothing but baptism satisfies the meaning of that, so baptism is the only thing that satisfies the meaning of the washing of regeneration. Now, where does Paul put the washing of regeneration or baptism in this passage? He says we're not saved by our own works of righteousness, but by the mercy of God. And that involves the washing of regeneration or baptism. He takes baptism and specifically says it's not a work of our own righteousness. It is rather a part of the merciful plan of God by which he saves mankind. Colossians 2.12 corroborates this. We didn't read all that verse a moment ago. Having been buried with him, in or by baptism, wherein also you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The one is properly taught and understood, understands the subject of baptism. When he is baptized, his faith is not in himself. It's in the operation or working of God who promised to save us through the blood of Christ as we're baptized into him. So baptism is not a work of human merit. It's a part of the design of God for the redemption of mankind. Necessary, essential part. Does the New Testament tell us the relationship between baptism and the blood of Christ? If we could get our friends out there who've been taught to deny the place of baptism in the plan of salvation to understand this one, truth. I think it would relieve and remove so much misunderstanding and so much opposition 
to the New Testament plan of salvation and baptism. In Acts 22, 16, quoted earlier, another context, but now let's come back to it here. Saul of Tarsus was told by Ananias, and now why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Now at times when I've been studying with someone and we study the subject of baptism and we get to this passage and they've been taught that baptism has nothing to do with salvation, you can be baptized later after you're saved if you want to, to join a church or whatever. But we look at this passage and they say, there you go. You just think that water washes away their sin. Just get them in that water and that water will wash them clean. I don't believe any such thing. And Ananias is not telling Saul of Tarsus any such thing. He does not tell us in this passage what washes away sins. What does he tell us then? He tells us when sins are washed away. We have to go elsewhere to find the what. Here we find the when. Be baptized and wash away. That's the when. Apparently sins are not taken away until one is baptized. Therefore, well, what does wash away our sin? We already answered that in the song we sang this morning, haven't we? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's an infinitely scriptural song. Mm-hmm. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. The heavenly host that John is able to see. Revelation 7 verse 14. Have had their robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Peter talks about it from the standpoint of redemption in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19, 18 and 19. For you were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from the vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood of a lamb without spot and blemish, or blemish and spot, even the blood of Christ. Nothing else can do it. That's why Christ had to die. Man was hopelessly doomed until that perfect Christless blood was shed. So what do we have here? Then? Sins are not washed away until one is baptized. But the blood of Christ is what washes them away. We must put those together, must we? When one is baptized scripturally, the blood of Christ washes away his sins. Is the only conclusion we can draw. And Paul actually puts those two thoughts together in Romans 6 and verse 3. Or are you ignorant that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Baptism is the avenue into the powers, the cleansing powers of the blood of Christ in his blood shed on the cross, his death. So, no blood of Christ, no forgiveness or salvation. No baptism, no blood. Therefore, one is lost without baptism because it is the means of gaining access to the blood of Christ that cleanses the soul of sin. Does the Bible tell us when we should be baptized? Yes, it even answers that question. The day of Pentecost, that same day, those who gladly received the word were baptized. They were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. Every day thereafter, people continued to obey that plan of salvation the morning. Added them to his church, verse 27. Here is a man riding along in a chariot, and uh, an evangelist joins the chariot, begins preaching Jesus to him. They don't wait until they get to the next town. See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Stop this chariot right now. I want to be baptized. And that was accomplished. Did any man forbid the water that they should not be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Those are the words of Peter Cornelius' household. 
And the implication is that they immediately were baptized. And on and on we could go. Acts chapter 16, the same hour of the night, though it was after midnight, Paul and Silas took the Philippian jailer and his household and baptized them. They didn't wait for the dawning of the day. Why do you think it was a matter of such immediacy in all of these cases? I'll tell you what I think. And I think the scriptures bear me out. These sinful souls were made to understand that until they were baptized into Christ, they were lost and undone. And they wanted to be relieved of their guilt and of the dread and fear that go with it. My friends, I don't know who is here this morning who might not have been baptized into Christ. I don't know who is here, who has been properly taught on the subject of baptism? I hope and pray that your ears have been open, your hearts have been tender to the simple message of the gospel. We've just studied, as I promised, not what men say about baptism, but what baptism is according to the Bible. I believe even very young children can understand this and respond to it. I hope and pray that if you have not been baptized into Christ for remission of your sins, that you will make the good confession of your faith in Christ and turn away from sin in your heart and your life. Give your full and total allegiance to Christ in repentance and then have all of that burden of sin lifted from you by being baptized into Christ where those sins are washed away by his blood. If you've been unfaithful to him, have not lived a faithful Christian life, though you obeyed the gospel at some point and were added to the church by the Lord, please don't delay, but come back to him. Paul was standing saying we heard and invite you to him. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, my glory shines on our way. Unto his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all of the other relay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or walk by His side. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. But to trust and obey. Please be seated. <clears throat> Please turn out to number 720. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> number 720. Why did my Savior come to earth? Help prepare our minds for the observance of the Lord's Son. We're going to sing the first and second verses. This song. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble Why did he choose a holy birth? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we humbly bow to the the cross of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we meditate upon the thought of his precious flesh being torn and his blood being shed, that we might have life eternal through no other way but his blood. We meditate upon this thought and take this bread and away. This is well pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name, amen. Our Father in heaven, as we continue this memorial of thy Son and our Savior, help us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Realizing that it represents the blood that he shed for us upon that cruel cross of Calvary. Realizing the shame and the suffering that he went through for us. Help us to take of this in a way and manner well pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Let's pray. <laughs> Severed apart from the Lord's Supper, we bow before the old Lord, giving back the portion of which we've been prospered. May we, be, may we give liberally and with a good and cheerful heart, and may this money be used to spread the gospel throughout the community, throughout the world, and to do benevolent work. Thy will be done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Five hundred and forty-five will be the closing song, and before uh, Brother Andy comes and leads us, and Brother Ryan leads closing prayer. After that, we would like to welcome each and every one to stay and eat with us after worship this morning, and then stay for the evening worship at one o'clock, following our meal together. I do want to commend Brother McLeish for a very fine lesson, very uh, excellent study on baptism, one that we all need to be reminded of and that the world needs to hear. And we do want to say that if anyone has any question about anything that's said or if you desire a further study with us, we encourage you, please let us know. We'd be happy to study with you or any answer any questions that you have.
Also, before we dismiss, we want to remind everyone that we are going to meet tomorrow night, Tuesday and Wednesday night, 7 p.m. And we hope that all or as many as possible will be able to come back at those times. Also, we have here at Central, uh, thank the Lord for the privilege we've had to not only have the radio broadcast on Sunday morning, but to start a new television program on Charter Cable Number 6. That's a local cable and charter. And that will air on Sunday nights. First one was last Sunday night, be tonight, and then uh, every Sunday night at 8.30 to 9 p.m. So if you have this uh, cable or you know others, uh, please remember this and please pray for us in this effort that it will be fruitful in doing the work of the Lord. Again, uh, we're so thankful to have everyone and so thankful for the good lesson and the good worship we've had this morning. Now, Brother Andy. <laughs> sing the first verse on them, number 545. Let's be standing as we sing. <clears throat> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid off somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Now we dear Lord, thank you for writing us coming this morning, studying another portion of our word. Dear Lord, be with us throughout this week in the gospel meeting. Dear Lord, be with the preacher that you may have the capacity, ability, and strength to do it. Dear Lord, hear those who are sick this time and they know them in the only way you know how. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, okay, we have 42, which 
Yeah. I was a very bad you get a butt on the wheel. I remember I was about 42. 42. 43. Funny <laughs> boy, one below there, son. Can you give me a slight boost? Thank you, no, you got it. Yeah, he's, he's tall enough to make it right there. Yeah, yeah. Do it, do it, do it. 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 Well, I have my total. Oh, wait a minute, 44 and 29 of what? 739. How much in checks? Huh? How much in checks should we have? Um, 4360. I'm sure. You're probably right. Is that what you come up the first time? Okay, just put that down, and I will uh, I will double check it. And you think this would be reinforced in some way inside here? It wouldn't be of much value. It's not that whatever. So you know, you put a preacher in the safe and the head down and he's going to run the running for a he discovered America and <laughs> 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 